See? No blackboard, nothing to write on, no writing on the wall. But we cannot do without a few words. No, still, we still have not managed the authentic human interaction by intuition. So everybody knows already what he has to say. Authentic and angelic. <laughs> angelic too, you see? I know that we're all angels somehow. Anyway, I'm very happy to begin this season's open lecture series with the man who is on the top of our list of professors. Because my name begins with A. Do his <laughs> name, but not only because of that. So I'm very happy that he is the second time in Sasfe. This time even more powerful than ever because now he has more space in the class. And the guy, people say, nicht, I, I read this in the Frankfurt School, calls you now the new master thinker. Uh, I don't know if they mean it uh, nicely, but I kind of think they kind of scare. There's somebody coming who they never really, because he did, he did something which is forbidden in Germany. He studied with Heidegger and then did Benjamin, also Frankfurt School, and both together is such a perverse way of mixing ideological enemies. In fact, the only way to deal with them is actually to embrace both, criticize both, but also um, have one against the other. Yes, pitch, pitch one uh, against the other. But as the students and you all have taken now classes with him last year and this year already knows, he's also a great treasure hunter, you know, in the uh, tradition of Benjamin, always finding hidden uh, coves of texts and people, the names long forgotten, but worth recovering and bringing into the discourse uh, of our uh, time. And so, please welcome Giorgio. <laughs> that I was supposed to give a lecture, which is a kind of communication that I do not particularly love. I first thought that I could speak on the nymphs, that was the subject of my seminar, during which I think we had a very good time speaking about images, women, nymphs, and all this about a very serious man was Evi Varbur, probably one of the most interesting intellectual figure of the first half of the 20th century, which only now uh, is, get, is getting the recognition, the recognition it deserved. But then I realized that in this way I was going to bore half of the audience who had already heard a lot about this. So I decided that it was probably better to board the whole audience. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to try to give a, a presentation, a short presentation, of a political and juridical problem that has taken most of the time since uh, uh, for the last two years. Avec lequel j'ai pas mal ennuyé mes amis, je demande personne. The state of exception. So let me first establish some uh, premises concerning terminology. As a philosopher whom I greatly admire once said, terminology is the poetic moment in philosophy. It doesn't matter if a philosopher clearly and explicitly defines his terminology or not. For example, Plato, with all his marvelous and almost manieristic Greek, never defines his most peculiar terminological invention, the idea. There is no definition of the idea for Plato. On the contrary, Spinoza, in his poor but beautiful Latin, always clearly define 
is his terms. Per attributum intelligo, per modum intelligo, etc. But in both cases, the result is the same. Scholar could never really understand what an idea is and what a mode is. So, what I want to tell you is that uh, a terminological choice and the choice of term is never neutral. Thus, in my case, I will use the expression state of exception to name a coherent, a coherent set of uh, juridical and political phenomena, which I will try to define. This term, which is common in German tradition, Ausnahme Zustand, but sometimes uh, not stands, always employed as an equivalent. This term is extraneous to the French or Italian scholars who prefer to speak of état d'urgence, état de siège fictif ou politique. And in the Anglo Saxon tradition, the corresponding terms are martial law or emergency powers. In this sense, and the choice of the term state of exception involves taking a position with respect to the very nature of the phenomenon. For instance, the notion of state of siege or martial law expresses, of course, a relation to the war, the state of war, who has always been decisive, important in the origin of this institution. But that shown in the final, in the final stage to the end to, uh, to show themselves to be inadequate as to define the nature of the phenomenon. That's why then it's necessary to add uh, sta state of siege, political, fictitious states of siege, etc. The state of exception is not a special section of the juridical order, the law which regulates the war, the state of war. Rather, it is the suspension of the whole juridical order itself, which marks, therefore, the limits, the threshold of the juridical order. It is perhaps for that reason that in public law there is not such a thing as a theory of the state of exception. Although the proximity between the state of exception and sovereignty has been established by the German jurist Karl Schmidt in his 1922 book on the political theology. Although his ominous definition of the sovereign as the one who decides on the state of exception has been widely debated, Nevertheless, the jurist continue to ignore the, this uh, phenomenon and they treat it more as a question facti than, than as a true juridical problem, juridical fact. According to uh, the opinion which is uh, very common, the state of, of, of an exception constitutes a point of imbalance between public law and politics, which, like a civil war, like insurrection and resistance, is located in an ambiguous zone at the border between the juridical and the political. But precisely for that reason, it seems to me that the question of the limits of the border becomes particularly urgent. 